Good evening, friends. Good evening. My name is Pastor Myron, and I'd like to welcome you to the Saturday night service of Grace Wesleyan Church, Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Grace Wesleyan, we're a welcoming community of believers who share Christ's grace, love, and redemption with all. Uh, tonight's a special night. We've got a special a guest, uh, a speaker, uh, Mr. John Riley's joined us tonight, and that's going to be, a, 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 I'm sure, a heartwarming, inspiring uh, session. Just a, a series of really quick announcements, uh, and all these things you can pick up on our website. I just want to touch base with them so you'll know we got a lot of things going on. Uh, first, there's a Habitat for Humanity build next Saturday, uh, and we've managed to get the schedule for the whole year's builds, and they're up on our website now. I just got that this week, so that's why we're just now telling you about it. If you're a part of that program, then you already know what to do. You know where it is. If you have any questions about it, I'll put Tony on the spot. Just see him after service, and he can give you some directions. Um, uh, our Peace, Love, and Potluck Fellowship is going to be on February 26th, right after this service. And uh, sign-ups are at both the tables coming in each way. I would invite you to sign up if you have any questions about that or if you want to help touch base with Joelle Kennedy. Uh, she's heading that up. Uh, the Men's Accountability Group will not meet uh, uh, this Monday night because it's Valentine's and we're going to be accountable to our wives. And we're going to stay home and uh, uh, spend time with our wives for Valentine's. Um, we're sappy like that. Um, the Wesley study will be this Thursday at 7 p.m. And for those who are keeping up with it, we're on the Sermon of the Mount. And this time it's discourse number five. Um, the Contagious Christian study will kick off next week uh, after this service and after the Sunday morning service. And we've got some books over on the table. Uh, if you haven't picked one up yet, we invite you to and plan to stay after the, the service uh, for that. That's going to be a, a very important study in the life of our church. And we'll go into that more next week. And lastly... Can you believe it? In two and a half weeks, we're going to kick off Lent. March 2nd, two and a half weeks, will be Ash Wednesday, and we'll have a 6 p.m. service for that on that Wednesday. So look for more information about that. Again, all the announcements are on the blue box uh, on our website, uh, gracewesleyan.org. Uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come to your house to worship you. And Lord, we thank you for uh, John coming and, and spending time with us today. And Lord, we ask that you make your Holy Spirit's presence known and felt by all here, Lord. Enliven our hearts and our minds to the messages you have for us. And hear our hearts as we sing praises to you. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you will stand as you are able. And join me as we state our beliefs as found in the historic Apostles' Creed. The words will be on the screen and they're in the bulletin. Let us state our beliefs. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening, everyone. You know, by the time we reached the book of Jeremiah, uh, God had space, God's patience had ran out. He had uh, brought then judgment, or was in the process of bringing judgment to the people of Israel because they had gone a whoring by worshiping other gods and their false insincerity, insincere worship their failure to trust God, the God of Yahweh. God had declared his judgment upon them, so he sent his prophet Jeremiah to pronounce his judgment. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. Jeremiah felt a deep affection for his nation. That is why he, has, he was heartbroken when he realized the extent of his people's sin and the anguish as he saw the judgment of God falling upon them. And here we have 
the reading from Jeremiah, chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. This is what the Lord says. Curse is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wasteland. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in, in parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. It leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to their deeds deserved. Here ends the reading of the word of God for the people of God. Amen. So good to be here tonight. Let's all stand and sing together. We give welcome to Ben again on percussion. He's with us tonight. That's right. I'm trying to get him to move down to Miami. I got to get him married. I got to find a good girl for him. That's right. So we're trying to get him married. So if anybody knows anybody out there... <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> if I get him married, he'll move down. So then we could have him all the time. He's, a, he's such a great friend. So let's, let's sing today. Let's raise our voice and sing, Holy is the Lord. Everyone see 
Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord. God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Say it again. Holy is the Lord. filled with his glory holy is the lord god almighty the earth is filled with his glory the earth is filled with his glory holy is the lord holy is the lord amen you may be seated We come now to the second reading for this evening. This comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 15 through 20. 1 Corinthians. Now, Corinth was an important and wealthy city on a narrow strip of land separating northern and southern Greece. The apostle Paul spent 18 months there on his second missionary journey and established a church there at Corinth. At the conclusion of his visit to Corinth, Paul left Ephesus, left for Ephesus, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Galatia. After leaving Corinth, Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthians uh, warning them to have no company with sexual sinners. But that letter had been lost to us. That was the first letter to the Corinthians. In his writing, the first Corinthians in our Bible, Paul is responding to reports from closed people about problems in the Corinthian church. In this letter, he provides apostolic guidance for dealing with these problems. The problems related to moral and ethical issues, issues related to how the, Christ, how the Corinthian Christians behave. However, now in chapter 15, Paul begins to deal with a doctrinal issue related to what these Corinthians believe. That doctrinal issue is the issue of the resurrection of Christ. Some Corinthians have questioned the resurrection of believers. Now in chapter 15, Paul deals with the resurrection of Christ and our own resurrection. Here now the reading from... 1 Corinthians. But if it is preached that Christ had been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Jesus from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sin. Then those, then those also who have been falling asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have been fallen asleep. Here ends the reading of the word of God for the people of God. Let's stand and sing about the goodness of God. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me all my days. 
I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faith All my life you have been so so good yeah. with every breath that I am made I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkness night you are close like no other I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, I have lived in the goodness of God all my life. All my life you have been faithful, all my life you have been so, so Your goodness, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Yeah. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Sing it again. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Yeah. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life. All my life you have been faith. We lift it up. Sir. All my life you have been so, so good. Yeah. With every breath that I am made, I will sing of the goodness of God. Can we sing that one more time? All my life. All my life have been all my life you have been so with every breath that I am made I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness God. He's so good. Let's give a round of applause. His goodness. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray for our offering. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for all the ways in which you provide for us and take care, for us, take care of us. And you meet us at our need, Lord, far more often than we realize. And at this time, we offer you back a small part of what you first gave us. Lord, we ask that you accept these gifts. And Lord, I ask that you bless these gifts and bless the givers and multiply them here at Grace Wesley in Fort Lauderdale. And Lord, may your Holy Spirit guide the use of these gifts so they're used according to your will and purposes. And as we ask Jesus for these things. Amen. Please stand and join me in our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessing flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, 
Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. John comes to us from a small town in Alabama. Uh, I knew of John for years. He spoke at the United Methodist Men's Retreats up in Leesburg. But I always happened to go to the other one because there's always two. And he spoke at the one that I didn't go to. I knew who he was, but I never got to hear him. And then by mere chance, I guess, uh, he came through and stayed with some friends that we have uh, in Tallahassee. And I got to meet him then. And we went out and broke bread together. And Annette and I went and heard him speak. And uh, he's got a great message. And each one's different, I understand. You tell a different story where you go, right? Okay. So, uh, I don't remember that. Okay, so there, there you go, there's that. But uh, when Fred and I talked about having guest speakers, John was the first name that came to mind. And so we're honored to have John tonight. He's going to speak to us and deliver a word from God to us. Please welcome John. Thank you very much. I wasn't hooked up. Uh, thank you for letting me be here, and Myron, thank you for your kind words. Um, I've been looking forward to this a long time, and I really appreciate getting to be here. And I thank you for coming, because Saturday night's kind of prime time. There's a lot you could be doing, and uh, I thank you for coming tonight. I'm glad I will not be speaking tomorrow night, because it's the Super Bowl. That's too much competition. But uh, this, is, this is great. Uh, Byron filled me in today on the history of the church and, and some things that are happening here, and it's great. Um, I love hearing about that and what brought him, of course, and Annette to Fort Lauderdale. It's really good. Uh, and these are the most comfortable folding chairs I've ever seen. Where'd y'all find these things? Man, they are, they are tremendous. Um, I'm not going to belabor a lot of personal stuff, but give you a little bit of background. I've had a couple of people ask me about my career with, o with the Oakland Raiders. Before Oakland, I, I was with, uh, uh, went to Auburn, I played at Auburn. I was drafted at Oakland in 1970. John Madden was the coach, one of the finest men I've ever known. Um, but I, I, um, NF the NFL for me meant not for long. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I made it till the Friday before our first regular season game. And uh, Coach Madden, I guess most of the teams did this, but uh, when, when, you, when you were about to be released from the Raiders, you call it getting cut, uh, you would be in your room. Oakland was the only team, I think, at the time that had two-a-day practice up until the first regular season game. So we'd go to breakfast, then you'd go back to your room and and if you were going to be cut that day, a trainer came to your room and said, Coach Madden wants to see you. That way you packed up and left while everybody was at practice and they acted like they didn't miss you. <laughs> so the trainer came to my room that morning. I thought I had it made. And he said, Coach Madden wants to see you. And I just looked at him and said, well, tell him I'm busy. <laughs> I was kidding, of course. Uh, I said, okay. So I walked over to his office and uh, sat down, he was behind the desk, sat down, and he looked at me, and this is what he said. John, you're a good boy, uh, a good southern boy. He said, you say yes or no, sir. You do everything I tell you to do, but we've got to let you go. We've decided to keep George instead of you. They had a veteran player named George Blanda. And uh, so when he said it, my reaction was what any 23-year-old pro football player would do. I started crying. <laughs> I mean, weeping crying. I mean, it was like, I won't go into detail crying. And it was like all this pressure since the seventh grade was just, had built up and then it's gone. And I didn't know what to do <laughs> because that's all I'd thought about. I, I didn't get an education. I went to Auburn. So I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So, so I, I thought, well, what do I do? So I, I stood up to leave, and uh, Coach Madden, I will never forget this, Coach Madden walked around the desk. He was a big man, and uh, a lot bigger than I'm only six feet. He was like six, I don't know, eight feet tall or something. But 
he, uh, he walked around and he gave me what I call a daddy hug. He hugged me and he said this, and I quote, John, I don't know what God has for you, but it's something better than the Oakland Raiders. And that day I couldn't believe that. Uh, I, I was just lost. And, uh, but it turns out that he told the truth. Uh, I came back home and, and then not to, not to take you through the next um, 52 years, but I'm 74. You won't have to figure that up. I know I look older, but I'm just 74. <laughs> and uh, so through the next few years, I went into business. Uh, I did some interviewing when I got back. I stayed in Abbeville with my mother and daddy for about five weeks. And daddy came in to see me one day and he said, boy, I love you. You know, in the South, you call every man, hey, boy. You know, you just, he said, boy, I sure do love you. I said, I love you too, daddy. He said, it's time you leave. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you got to go get a job. I said, well, yes, I figured that. Uh, so I interviewed, anyway, went to work with uh, AT&T and uh, South Central Bell at the time. And, uh, and, and I had had an offer from another company. And I, I didn't enjoy what I did. It wasn't because of the company. I had a great company. But I called this other, after six months, I, I said, is a job still available? They said, yes. I went to West Point Pepper, a textile manufacturer. And... You know West Point Pepper? Really? We're probably kin. <laughs> and isn't it terrible what's happened to textiles in America? Anyway, uh, I went there, and after two years, the company started using me as a motivational speaker in the corporation. Then they started loaning me out to other companies, and I thought, well, <laughs> might as well try to do this on my own. So I, uh, there was a man that I got to know and uh, he hired me as his employee of his corporation. And he said, I'm going to hire you and you just speak. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, but you're going to speak for my company too, which I did for the next 45 years. He died two years ago. Two of his kids took the company over and they figured I had been there long enough. <laughs> it's hard to get fired at 72. I'm going to tell you, it is. But uh, that, this has been uh, more than I ever dreamed of, what I've gotten to do. It's like I tell people, I hadn't made a lot of money, but boy, have I had fun. And when Myron called and said, uh, I want you to come down and speak, I said, well, I'd love to, Myron, but, but I, I've just lost a job. How much will I have to pay you to let me come? <laughs> he said, no, we're going to pay you. I said, I'm coming. <laughs> so I've looked forward to this. That's, that's a little bit of background. So I, I back up a little. In 1967, I went to Auburn in 66, made the freshman team, because back then you only played freshman ball. You couldn't play varsity but three years. So I made the freshman team, and they almost, the varsity almost killed me and everybody else on the freshman team. But once we got through that, I made the, the team as a sophomore, and that was the greatest thing that ever happened to me until October of 1967. When an All-American running back came to my room in the athletic dorm at Auburn, shared the gospel with me, and I asked Christ to come into my life. That's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I started to grow a little bit. Um, word got out that uh, a crazy football player had come to know Christ. <laughs> and uh, people couldn't believe it because I had a different reputation back then. And uh, so when the word got out, people started asking me to come speak to youth groups and churches and civic clubs, rotary clubs, and I loved it. And uh, life started to change. One of the biggest things that um, knowing Christ has done for me is to realize that you always have value. I've been fired a lot of times <laughs> in jobs and football and, and when that happens, you, you kind of feel like you don't have much value anymore. Have you ever been through that? And uh, so I'd go through that, and God would always do something to show me that I had value. And tonight I want us to talk about um, don't quit. You say, I don't need to hear that. I'm not going to quit. Well, somebody asked me a while back, some man who's a young guy that I know, 
I do, I speak for him several times a year. He lives in Atlanta. And every January, I speak for him in Colorado. I just was out there a little over a week and a half ago. And uh, I do a men's conference that he puts together. And after the conference, before we flew back, he said, um, I want you to do something for me. He said, I want to start it with this. He said, what is your greatest fear? I said, Archie, thank you. That's a good question. I said, my greatest fear is getting old and of no use. He said, okay, now here are three questions. And he gave me three questions. He wrote them and he said, think about this. And I want you to write about these questions. What do I need to know at age 56 that you wish you had known at a younger age? What would you do? I've been working on it. I'm up to six pages of things I wish I had known, wish I had done, wish I hadn't done. And, and in a way that does no good because you can't go back and do anything about it. But what it does do is to make you realize that, that things are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good. <laughs> I enjoyed the guys singing, didn't you? I mean, that was good. God is so good, so, so good. Well, there you all are. Great, great. I didn't know where you, I couldn't spot you back. You're a little far away. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'll, singing that song, I thought, I, I, I got really, really emotional. Because he is so good to us. Through all the tough things we go through, he's so good to us. So why would we quit? So let's read a little, leave, read a little scripture and then we go back and talk about it a little. This is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 21 through 25. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as some manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Then verse 37, for yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. I saw a bumper sticker some time ago. You can quote this because it's really real. <laughs> it was on the back of a septic tank cleaning truck. <laughs> now get the picture. And the bumper sticker just simply said, on weekends we haul milk. <laughs> That's awful. I think about that every morning when I wake up. I'll read you before I get out of bed and I ask this question. What am I hauling? You, you ever do anything? What am I hauling? On weekends we haul milk. One of the companies that I speak for um, is called Great Southern Wood. They make a product called Yellow Wood. And I was with a group uh, Thursday night. And I shared that bumper sticker. <laughs> now these are a bunch of salesmen and guests who have come in from dealers, dealerships all around the country. And I shared that story. 
One guy really laughed. I thought, well, he's had too much beer. <laughs> but he really laughed. And after it was over, he came up to me and he said, I've seen that bumper sticker. <laughs> what are you hauling? Do we haul the same thing on weekends that we haul during the week? And, and what we're talking about, of course, is character and thoughts. What, what, what do we haul when we come to church? When we're at work or play or you go out to eat with somebody, because what you are hauling, what I'm hauling, is going to come out. Regardless of age, regardless of background, regardless of anything, it's going to come out. Who you are, who I am, spills over. Now, we say in that attitude, yes, it's attitude. It's also perspective, and it's also, of course, the inner being or the character. Attitude is how we respond to something. Perspective is how we look at something. Character is really who we are on the inside, and it comes out. And it's Christ in you, and Christ in me, the hope of glory. Colossians 3. Christ who is our life, Colossians 3, 4, who comes out. And when he's there, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, when we receive him, we want to grow in him, and we want him to become our life. As John said in John 3, 30, he must increase, and I must decrease. We want to give over more and more and more of our lives to Him. Because when we do that, a lot of things happen, don't they? One is, we have a reason not to quit. One of my favorite um, people of the past, and, and it's not just because of my background. My, my mother was Cherokee Indian. That wasn't popular when I was growing up. My mother was Cherokee, my daddy was Irish, so I'm a mongrel. <laughs> you put Cherokee Irish together, we have fun. So I love <laughs> I've always had a pretty good time. Uh, so I, I love reading stuff, but this is from Chief, Chief Tecumseh. Uh, you probably know a lot about, but anyway, Tecumseh was um, one of the rare chiefs that he didn't stay in his home territory. As a matter of fact, he came from Ohio and came all the way down to Alabama. Gathering forces to fight the invasion in this country. He, um, he was born in, uh, excuse me, 16, uh, I'm sorry, 1768. He died in 1813. He was killed in a battle in Canada. But what he did was try to get allies and in Alabama, he talked with the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Creek, and Choctaw. And the Creeks were the only ones who joined him. Everybody else was for him, but they're the only ones who joined him. And this is what he said one time. Live your life that the fear of death can never enter your heart. Trouble no one about their religion, respect others and their view, and demand that they respect yours. Love your life. Perfect your life. Beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life long and its purpose in the service of your people. When it comes your time to die, be not like those whose hearts are filled with the fear of death. So that when their time comes, they weep and pray for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way. Sing your death song and die like a hero going home. I try to live by what God says in the Bible. And to come see Maybe because some missionaries got to him. I don't know what happened in his life. But he did that same thing. Put on your death face. Die like a hero going home. 
Well, we've lost all those customs. Used to, the face would be painted for Indian Native Americans. We don't know how to do that anymore. We don't know what a death song is, but I, be- I believe this. <clears throat> As Christians, we have a death song. Bunch of them. We sang two or three of them tonight. The goodness of God. How about amazing grace? How about a mighty fortress? One of Annette's favorites is our God. How about on Christ the solid rock I stand? All other ground is sinking sand. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Those are good death songs. Dying in Christ. Living in Christ. Not fearing, but moving ahead. I have to do this or I want to quit. It ain't been very easy the last couple of years, has it? Whatever we've been through, it's not been real easy. March the 15th, I flew into Atlanta from an, an international flight. Without going into great detail, I'm very fortunate. I, I have global entry, so you know, you just push and you, you go on. And, and I asked a guy in security, I said, what, what, What's happened? He said, Where you been, man? <laughs> I said, Well, I've been out of the country, I told him the country. And he said, We have a virus. We're shutting down the airport. We're, we're closing it. We're closing all that. I said, You just got in here. By the 17th of March, 2020, Every speaking engagement I had for two years was canceled. Everything wiped out. Now, I I live, uh, I'm single. I've been single for 20 years. I've gotten weird. But but when when you're single, you live alone, you can do weird stuff. And uh, I sing, I talk, I talk out loud. You can walk around any way you can walk around. You can do whatever. So I'm at, I'm at home, you know, like, what am I going to do? So I'm praying a lot, and I'm reading a lot, and, and I'm, I'm searching a lot, and doing all kind of a lot. And God really started dealing with me, and it's been going on for, over two, for almost two years. And this is one of the things that has come out. It's only four things, and uh, we'll be through by seven. Isn't that what we do? Okay, something like that. 7.15? 7.30? No, I'm kidding. I'm joking. Okay, okay. here are four reasons. You, you could probably add, you say, I got another reason. Well, I'd like to hear them, but I got four that I, that, that I think really came from Hebrews 10 and Jeremiah. And uh, Isaiah and Psalms and Genesis and Exodus, all through the Bible. Number one, why shouldn't we quit? Number one, because we started. (laughs) This is really deep, hang with me. (laughs) Don't quit because we started. You know what Jesus said, when you put your hand to the plow, don't look back. Does that mean that we should never quit anything? No, it doesn't. But it simply means that when we're doing something we believe God has called us to do, we started, we felt like, Lord, you're leading me to do this. You're moving me by the Spirit, so I'm not going to quit. Does that make sense? Or in other words, look forward. Let's don't look back and say, well, what could have happened if I had done this, if I had done that, if I hadn't have done that like I'm writing to Archie, if I hadn't done these things, but I'm writing them not to regret it, but to say, don't do this, Archie, or do this, or try this. Look forward. You've gotten started. You came to Christ October of 1967. You came to Christ whenever you did that. We started, and you looked at it, and, and we didn't know everything. We just thought, well, number one, I, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to know God. I want to be in I want to. So we started. But look at what has happened in the last, my goodness, 
55 years. Or five years. Or two years. Or whatever it might be. You started. Don't quit. Look forward. Number two. Now hang with me because they are all real complicated. They're not. I went to Auburn, remember? All right. Number two. (laughs) You have invested. You invest. I've invested in some things in my life. None of them worked. I'm talking about money. I, I, you know, I'd get a little money and invest in this. And, and they'd call me and say, we're sorry. That, uh, that company went out of business. You lost everything. <laughs> well, I've, I've found out over the years. You, tell me you haven't done that too. <laughs> but but I've, found, I've found out over the years that um, I, don't in, I don't invest well. I, I, I don't study it. I don't invest well. So I decided to make my investments in people. That's worked really well. I have three daughters. I have five grandchildren. Um, I'm, I'm not the best daddy you ever saw. I hate to say it. I'm not the best granddaddy you ever saw either. But I love them. Has it been easy? No. We've been through rehab. <laughs> We've been to the police station a few times. <laughs> we, we've got all kinds of stuff. But, but, I, but I, I never looked at it and said, okay, I've invested this in you, but you're blowing it. I'm through. See ya. Never did that. I have one daughter that I don't hear from. I think she loves me, but I'm probably kidding myself. But I don't hear from her. But if I hear from her and she needs me, I'm going. Because I'm invested. (laughs) And 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 I started. I I was there when she was born. Well, I'll get I'll I'll get into daddy stories. I've got a granddaughter who'll be 24 tomorrow. I won't see her, but I'll talk with her, leave her a message. We invest in our children. We invest in our grandchildren. We invest in life. We've invested in our Christian life. We have said at some point in our lives, I leave that behind. Because like Coach John Madden, great man, like he said, I don't know what God has for you, but it's better than the Oakland Raiders. We looked at things in our lives, didn't we? We said, "Uh, this is better than that. And, and as we get older, we really want to do that, don't we? Because we ain't got much time to play around. <laughs> well, I'll try that a few years. <laughs> no. No, it's like, I don't think I'll try that. We've invested. Number three, there's still work to be done. And, and this is one of the big reasons not to quit. You, you're useful. I'm scheduled to speak in... July for um, the um, what is the Alabama Seed Research Producers anyway they study peanuts. <laughs> you you remember George Washington Carver? That man found over four hundred uses for a peanut. Thank God, changed the economy of Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi. I mean, all kinds of places. Well, I'm I'm speaking for their annual meeting, Lord willing, if I don't die first. But anyway, I'm speaking for them. And uh, I was talking with a young man who's the president. He's 36, so he's young. He's a child. And I was talking to him the other day, and and he said, well, um, we, we want something. He was telling me one. I said, well, I try to take. He said, no, no, we don't want a sermon. I said, you won't get a sermon. I said, I'm going to tell you something, Jordan. That's his name. I'll call him. That's his name. I said, Jordan, everything I talk about is biblically based. I just may not say it's from Philippians or John or, or Habakkuk. He said, oh, that's fine. So we talked about it. And then he said, by the way, on Sunday morning, we have a little devotional prayer breakfast type thing. Would you do that too? I said, yeah, and I'll do it free. He said, really? (laughs) I said, you bet you. I'll do that free, but the other one I won't. But that'll be free. Because 
I want to talk to people about, there's still a lot of work to be done. The man who recommended me is like older than I am. Doctor, uh, anyway, he's head of the research stuff. And uh, he recommended me. We want to talk about there's still work to be done. Don't ever think you're finished. I talked with a man a while back. He said, I want to go to the Bahamas to Freeport and see the work you're doing there. I said, let me know when you want to go. He said, what moves you to keep going? And this is a young man, a businessman. I said, well, I'll tell you, Phil, what keeps me awake at night. I said, you and I have been talking on the phone here for 10 minutes, right? He said, yeah. I said, I've kept you too long. But I said, in those 10 minutes that you and I have been talking, 50 children under the age of 14 have starved to death. One child dies every 12 seconds of starvation. Also, Phil, since you and I have been talking, four people have died every second. And according to statistics in the world, only about maybe half have heard the name of Jesus. There's a lot left to be done. We're not finished. I have a million dreams that keep me awake at night. Like the guy said in The Greatest Showman. When I heard that line, I thought, that's it. What are the dreams that keep you awake at night? If you don't have any, get some. And you probably do. I dream, I'm talking about, I don't mean go to sleep and dream. I do that too. But, but just, you're sitting there maybe staring out the window. You know, you know what I'd like? I'd like, and then you start thinking and the wheels start turning because a dream is the only thing that'll turn into a goal. And a goal is the only thing that'll turn into a plan and a plan is the only thing you can put into action. We need to be sharing the gospel. What did Jesus say? Jesus gave you and me a reason to live in Matthew 28, didn't he? He's about to ascend to the Father and the Holy Spirit is coming and, and Jesus is in us by the Holy Spirit and he says, all right, boys, <laughs> paraphrasing, all right, and ladies, because there were women there too, we know. He says, now, go into all the world. Help me with this. Go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe whatsoever I've commanded you and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. There's, there's, our, there's our reason to just not quit. We're still breathing. We're still alive. We can still do something. Some folks took me out to eat the other night. Let me tell you all something. Single men will always go out to eat with you. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> so glad to get a meal. And uh, we got there, and this restaurant was... Um, Crowded. And uh, they said, sorry, there'll be a wait. I thought, well, shoot. Let's just sit down and talk. We sat down. This lady came over and sat down by me with her daughter. I looked up and said, how y'all doing? I mean, I look pretty harmless. So how y'all doing? She said, fine, how are you? I said, I'm pretty good. That your daughter? Now we'll go through the whole time. She said, oh, it is. And the little girl... <laughs> smiling. I said, how old are you? She said, 15. I said, 15. What grade are you in? Ninth? She said, yes, sir. I, oh, two of the best years of my life in the ninth grade. And she, <laughs> she kind of laughed. <laughs> and, and I said, uh, y'all live here? And anyway, we just went through a little talk. And I looked at her and I said, let me ask you a question. I don't want to offend you, but y'all out to eat and you look so nice and you smell so good, and, and I bet y'all having a good time. A special occasion? No, just mother-daughter night out. I said, fantastic. I said, let me ask you this. It's a terrible thing if you're taken in the wrong way, so don't be offended. But let me just ask, because I think it's the most important question in the world. If you died this very night, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? 
Now, you may not have feel, feel led to ask anybody that. I just kind of like doing it. And I get away with it some way. I said, do you know for sure you go to heaven? And, and this lady said, no, I don't. I said, how about you, honey? She said, no, sir, I don't. I said, wouldn't you like to know? They said, we really would. I just shared one Bible verse. God so loved the world, that's you and me, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would never perish but have everlasting life. I said, that's the whole Bible in miniature, Martin Luther said. Would you pray with me right now and ask Christ to come into your life? They said, we sure will. And they, I said, well, just pray after me. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Went through a little prayer, and they prayed. I looked at them and said, now, where is Jesus? They said, he's in our heart. I said, we're going to be in heaven together. They said, here we are. Well, we, went to, we were called to sit down. Lo and behold, they were called to sit down right by us. They sat down. I said, don't worry. I'm not going to give you a sermon. <laughs> and they kind of laughed. But I did buy their supper. Now, that's no pat on my back. It just simply said, hey, you talked with me. I got up to leave. The lady said, the waitress just told me you paid for our supper. I said, yeah, it's a gift. Just like salvation is a gift. God gave it to us and we can share it with other people. See, we're not finished. You may run into somebody tonight at a restaurant. You may have a neighbor. You may have a child he hadn't talked with about Christ. You may be uh, saving some money you didn't know what for. And you find a mission that you know is for real. And it's leading people to Christ and feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and giving people a place to live. They're really doing what Jesus said. And you can give some money. Number four. I lied and I didn't mean to. It's two minutes after seven. But, but I'm going to do this quick. Last point. There's no turning back. Why? Because the finish line's in sight. <laughs> That's why we can see the finish line. Why would you quit? You say, oh, no. I don't know. No, it, we, we see the finish line because we know, regardless of our age, physical condition, or anything else, we're going to die. Statistics show one out of one dies. We're going, we're going to do that. So there's the finish line. What, as Mary Oliver, one of my favorite poets, says, what are you going to do with your one wild, precious life? <laughs> Isn't that a good question? What are you going to do with your one wild, precious life? Because it's going by really fast. You just let me spend an hour with you of your life. That's precious. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much that you would do that. That you would let me come here and you would take your time to come and let me share some things. Wow, the finish line is in sight. Quick closing story, very quick. Just an old high school story. You know, you get old, you reminisce. Uh, I was a senior in high school. Um, I lettered in four sports in three of them three years. Not because I was good, because it was a little high school and they needed me. <laughs> I loved football. I played the others just because you did. But my senior year during baseball, I played baseball, and, uh, but, but they had track. I never did track. I'm not a runner. Uh, but the coach said to me one day, we had a head football coach, had a head basketball coach, and then they'd swap out on others, baseball, but the, they coached everything. And the coach said to me, he said, uh, you're going to run track. And I said, back in those days, you only said one thing to a coach, and that was, yes, sir. He said, you're going to run track. I said, yes, sir. What am I going to do? He said, you're going to throw the discus. He said, we don't have a discus throw. I said, yes, sir. Where is it? He says, right over there. I went over and picked it up. First time I'd ever seen one. I said, coach, excuse me, how do you do it? He said, I don't know. Just work on it. True, true story. I went over and worked on it. We had the conference meet two weeks from that day. I placed third in the conference. There were only three discus stores in the conference. 
That's a true story. <laughs> so I placed third and lettered. But, but I was about to go off the field, you know, and headed to baseball practice. And the coach said, come over here. I said, yes, sir. He said, buddy's sick. You're going to do the 440. I said, yes, sir. 440, four football fields plus 40 yards. I can do that. We lined up, I had the inside lane, this is a quick story. I had the inside lane of six, three of my buddies from our neighboring high school rivalry, rivalry they, were, they were better friends to me, those, anyway, they're lined up and they looked at me and they said, why are you running? I said, buddy cook sick, I have to run. They said, oh, okay. They didn't say, so we took off. Now I'm, I'm in the inside lane, so I'm already ahead by a lot. And I looked around after 100 yards, and nobody was close to me. I thought, piece of cake. <laughs> I'm going to win this thing. <laughs> we got halfway around, and two of the guys were really gaining on me. And I looked back. You don't ever look back. I didn't know that. They were smiling at me, and I thought, why are they smiling? We got 300 yards to the race, and they blew by me like I was standing still. Ten yards later, the other three blew by me. And at 20 yards out, my calves turned to rocks. And I, I couldn't run. So I stopped, and I was walking, and I just could walk because I was cramping so bad. And I kind of fell for a second. Two of my buddies came back, grabbed me on each side. They were from the school. They had just won. And they helped me across the finish line. They said, get your uh, fanny up. You are going to finish this race. And I did. I would have crawled if I'd have to, had to because the finish line was there. And when you see the finish line, you don't quit. You keep going. Well, that's all I got. Those four. But I think that works, don't you? We started, so look ahead. We're invested there's a lot of work left to do, and we see the finish line. So until that time, let's, um, as, I, as the coaches used to say, leave everything on the field. Because when we die, we want to go singing our death song like heroes going home, which is what we will be doing. In Christ. Right? All right. All right let, let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for letting me be here. I've had a ball. Thank you, Lord, for these dear folks that have been so kind, so sweet, laughed at every corny thing I've said. Th thank you, Lord, that together in Christ, we can come together, we can pray, read the Bible, hear some really good music, and talk about you. Thank you that you're so, so good. Thank you that you love us so much. Thank you that you care about everything in our lives. And we always have value to you. Thank you that you always use us in ways we don't even know. But you do. We thank you. Now, Lord, may each of us, whether in this, in this gymnasium or watching uh, later this recording, may each of us in our own hearts, not out loud, but just simply silently, as a commitment to you, may we say to you, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross and shedding your blood for me. Thank you for taking away all my sin all my guilt, and all my shame. Thank you for rising from the dead to be my Savior, my Lord, and my life. Please, Lord Jesus, live your life through me. For I pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Father, may this be our prayer and our meditation and our commitment to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, you want to come? Oh, thank you. <laughs>
Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for letting me be. Hope to see y'all tomorrow. Thank you. Now you just got an invitation to come tomorrow, too, so uh, that's all great. Uh, I wrote down two things when John was talking. One was wisdom and character. I just want to thank that uh, he shared a lot of wisdom and a lot of character with us tonight. So thank you again, John, for everything that you I've been told that uh, last week was our two-year anniversary. Uh, I was at a, a convention, so I wasn't here, but two years, did you? Get, has God been good or what? <laughs> I'm not sure how many of us really knew that we would be here for two years, but God knew, and uh, we stayed focused, and we're going to continue to stay focused, and great things are in the future for us. We do have some people that we need to pray for. Um, but Sue Blaylock's daughter, Dawn, passed away. I think you may, most of you have probably heard that. Uh, there's, been an, uh, there's going to be an announcement that on Saturday, February 19th, there'll be a, uh, from 1 to 3, there'll be a viewing, and from 3 to 4, there'll be a service. And I assume we're going to announce where that's going to be and, uh, and all that. Okay. Uh, I'll make sure that that gets posted and stuff. Um, also, we want to remember to keep praying for Mike Leach. He, he uh, just uh, starting his treatment. He got his uh, got set up for his treatment, and he'll be starting that. And you know, Mike's kind of a a, a funny guy because you look at him, you think he looks so healthy and so young, and he's so stoic about all that's going on. And he reminds me of some people at John Knox when I told him I was 71. They go, "Oh, I got kids your age." <laughs> he's not a young guy, but he looks like he's a young guy. <laughs> so we'll be praying for Mike and Gussie. Uh, and please remember to keep praying for Bill Carey and, and Lynn Frazier. And I was just told that uh, Gail Johnson's brother, Dennis, is on a ventilator. Uh, they, they don't know, if, they didn't think that it was necessarily COVID, but he started having some breathing problems and now he's on a ventilator. He's not a young man, so we'll be praying him. So praying for him. So join me in a word of prayer. We'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Father, we have so much to be thankful for, and we just heard a lot about that tonight. We thank John for that. We thank all of the people that are here tonight, and we've always asked the same thing, and that is just bring the Holy Spirit into Grace Wesleyan Church, into each one's heart, and tell us and direct us what to do, because we want to be your servants from now on. So thank you for the two years that we've been together. We look forward to just marching down as Christian soldiers for you and this community and beyond. So thank you again, and thank you for the way that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's all stand saying, On Christ the solid rock I stand. On hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness i dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on jesus name on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand when darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanged grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anger hold within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. 
All of the ground is sinking sand His oath is covered And His blood supports me in the whelming flood When all around my soul gives way He then is all my hope and stay On Christ the solid rock I stand All of the ground is sinking sand All of the ground is sinking sand When he shall call with trumpet sound Oh, may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Far less to stand before the throne On Christ the solid rock I stand All of the ground is sinking sand All of the ground is sinking sand John, thanks for being with us tonight. And, uh, I'm sure your message touched all the hearts in one way or another, uh, mine and several, but friends, he's right. There is more work to be done, and we all know it. That's why we're here, because there's work to be done that wasn't getting done. And so we came here. So maybe we can be motivated just a little more to take that next step, and maybe one day we can all be bold enough to encounter strangers in a restaurant and say, do you know where you're going to be? Do you know if you're going to heaven? Maybe. But until that time, maybe we can find the places where we can be the hands and feet and heart of Christ to a world we know is in desperate need of His love. Friends, go in peace. Amen.